Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by legendary trainer and world class human being Teddy Atlas. Teddy, what's really good? Hey, I'm seeing you. <laughs> what could be better than that? Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Teddy. Before we jump into things, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the um, subscribers and the people who've left reviews and shared the links. Such a massive help as we try to grow the show, and it takes a lot of effort to go in, go in, goes into making these shows. And um, thanks, special thanks to our producer, to the stars, Rob Moore, has done a great job with uh, organizing. Well, yeah, we're, we're not doing this, yeah. I, you know. And without my push from my children and and the belief of Rob and all the resources that he's brought to this and effort that he's brought to it. We wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, he I deserves a um, huge thank you. He's really done a, a, a crap load of work behind the scenes to make this all come together from organizing the cameras and the sound, and it's it's no small task. So um, shout out Rob Moore, PR, producer to the stars. Um, before we jump into things, again, thank you to everyone. As a special thank you to everyone who's um, subscribed and left reviews, we've got... Um, Two boxing gloves signed by uh, Teddy Atlas and our upcoming guest, the great Vasily Lomachenko. And what we're going to do with these gloves, we're going to give one to a random YouTube subscriber. So when you see the YouTube show, please subscribe, leave comments. We read them all. Uh, Teddy doesn't read them. I read them. And the ones that are uh, nasty and uh, aggressive towards me really hurt my feelings. So please say nice things about me. And the other, the second glove we're going to give to... See, a, he's sensitive, guys. <laughs> very, oh, very. You got, do you <laughs> understand what those kind of, they're not nice comments, what they can do to a person, a good person? <laughs> do you understand? You see glasses that he's wearing now, right? No, don't you, point out you, the glasses. You, you see that, right? <laughs> you, you, you see what you're doing to the guy, all right? Be thoughtful. Be thoughtful. Come on, we can all be better. Thank you. So one look, glove. Look. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, really? Yeah. Showing my age. God. So one glove is going to go to a random YouTube subscriber. And again, please keep leaving the comments. Um, and the second glove is going to go to uh, our favorite review on Apple Podcasts. So please subscribe to the show. Leave a review, even a nasty one. We're cool with that. Whoever. W no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we appreciate we you guys. Get better, so we'll, so if you guys. We want to get We you, appreciate all these. If you have some constructive criticism, please feel free to leave it on the um, review section in the Apple Podcast. So we're going to give one glove to the YouTube subscriber and one to our favorite Apple Podcast review. Again, signed by Teddy Atlas and our upcoming guest, Vasily <coughs> Lomachenko. Um, you'll still have plenty of time to do this. Uh, we're going we're gonna to conduct a giveaway in about two weeks from right now. So uh, check the show notes for details on how to enter the contest, and uh, we'll continue to post uh, updates on Teddy's social media handles. Um, Teddy, how are things in camp with Alex? We're in Oxnard, California. Halfway through. Again. Halfway through, yeah. baby. Um, you know, four weeks down, four weeks to go. And uh, really three weeks of real hard work because I, I start really pulling them back the last week. So that's how I look at it, and that helps me get to the finish line. Yep. You know, uh, three more weeks of hard work, sparring, and then the last week you pull back, you you get the trip out to the east and get on location and start acclimating and, you know, actually just making sure you win the first part of the fight, which is making weight. But um, everything, listen, I'm always, I'm always careful about saying everything's great because we're blessed everything's good and thank god for that and so far so good but i know what can come down the road at you at any minute you know that that things can change there's a lot of variables out there in the air that you can't control when you're in a camp with a fighter a human being not a machine you know i think so, a lot of people would be surprised to actually hear how um emotionally invested you are in the camp i know rob and i uh spoke with you on uh we're recording on a sunday on a friday we spoke with you and i was surprised at how sentimental you were getting about missing your family and i can relate to that because i travel a lot for work but i was i shouldn't say surprised but i was touched by how 
sentimental you were getting about your own family and about what you were doing here and about the fact that, you know, Alex's son was sick and now he's staying in the hotel. His daughter. His his daughter. daughter. And he's staying at the hotel to avoid getting sick and a lot of, you know, as the trainer, you're kind of in control of most of the decisions. And she's okay, thank God. But, you know, she got got the flu. Yeah, like like kids do. They're in school, right? Of course. And that's a normal part of, uh, you know, being a parent, a normal part of having a family. He's got three children. They get sick. Yeah. But when you in camp with a fighter getting ready for a fight you, you those are things you have to try to avoid yeah and and you you try to avoid them the best you can and you and you pray that you can avoid them and those are the things that could come down the road that you can't control that that you don't plan on you know and uh, no matter how good training you do that those things can come at you so you know you you just again you just hope that it all comes together on that on that big night, that you're doing everything that you feel is right, you have a plan, you're, you're sticking to that plan, but your eyes are open. You're watching to see, do I got to pull him back? Uh, am I behind? Am I ahead? You know, is his weight getting too low? Do I need to, you know, uh, let him let his weight go up a pound or two because I got three weeks of sparring left? Mm-hmm. So, so do I need to put a little bit more weight on to to burn it up to have it in the engine? So in the, you know, in, in the furnace, so to speak, uh, for energy. So you, you got to keep your eyes open. You got to look. But so far, so good. Thank goodness. Thank God. Uh, we've we got our second spawn partner in, so we have two spawn partners here now. And they're, they're the right styles, and they're doing everything that, you know, I, I'll go over things with them. i watch tape with them of the opponent we're fighting and say, you see what the guy's doing here? I'd like you to try that today. Oh, that's an interesting observation. That I, and the, the reason I brought that up, and I want to come back to that point about the uh, watching tape with the sparring partners, the reason that I wanted to talk about this and bring up uh, your own emotional journey with this camp is a lot of fight fans who might not be experienced with the sport and just be a fan from a distance, don't realize or recognize how much is going on behind the scenes and how many people are involved in the process and what exactly goes into it. You know, some people might just think they're training, doing cardio and physical activities, then they show up on fight night and let's do it. But there is a lot of emotional energy and and time and effort from a, a team of people that go into this. And I, I was just, I wanted to point out to people how emotional I think it can be for not just the fighter but for yourself being away from your family it's a huge commitment to be away for I mean people my grandchildren my children my wife of course yeah exactly but it's part of the sacrifice you make when you want to do something special when you want to do something that listen it all starts with reminding yourself or never forgetting the privilege that you have for this opportunity. Yeah. I don't forget that. Yeah. It's a privilege to have this opportunity. So that's the first thing. Be grateful. That's the first thing. Be grateful. And it's not uh, just a commitment from you, but from your family as well. They're, of course. They're very it's, vested it's in this. It's all part of it. And so you have the opportunity uh, to help your family, to help mm-hmm. yourself. And But then there's a sacrifice that goes with it. But yeah. again, you're, you're grateful that you even are in a position to be able to make that sacrifice. Yeah. And But, you, you know, you, you do... Listen, you know... I don't want to let down the fighter. I don't want to let my family down. And, um, and I'm, I'm blessed I'm, that I have this opportunity, this, this privilege, as I call it. But the responsibility hangs over you. Yeah. Because you are responsible. You're yeah. responsible to not fail the trust of that person who's getting in that ring, who's believing everything you tell them every day for, eight weeks of training camp. Yeah, and you yeah. want to be right. You want to be right. And sometimes you you hit walls emotionally as a trainer. Like the other day, I hit a wall. I, I just hit a wall. It was like, I want my family. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. I, you know. I'm not trying to cry. Yeah, you know? no, no. I felt for you. But, but <clears throat> I, it's just like, I, I need my family. Yeah. But I need to keep going. Yeah. So I don't have my family. Yeah. So I have them on the phone. I have them, you know, I, I discovered this thing, um, it's really pretty amazing. So I'll tell you about it. It's a thing called FaceTime. This thing, <laughs> I, it's like I, 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 you can actually see the it's people. Like the Jetsons. You, you can see. I'm, <laughs> you can see the people you're talking to. They could even give you kisses. <laughs> and your grandchild can like kiss the phone. Yeah. And wow, it's like. <laughs> It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know about? Oh yeah, I use FaceTime you know? when I'm away with my uh, children all the time. 
It's really great. Yeah. You know, but it, it it's it's not enough. Yeah. But 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 it's it, it is great. Better so, than nothing. Yeah, it is. But but anyway, not complaining in any way. It's just that you you've you need your family and um I need my family. So but you do this you know, you commit to it and, and you gotta finish it and you gotta do it and you can't be uh you can't be half stepping. Uh, you can't show any of that effect around your fighter. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you you feel it, and you, you you take a deep breath, and you say, "Okay, let's go. Yeah, let's go. What do we got to do? What do we got to do tomorrow?" You there's know? a lot of things in boxing that are outside of the boxer's control, like all the politi- the the, poli- the politics involved, the judges. There's just a million variables. So, to the extent you can control as much as you can, is that's what I like. And I, I got the you. way you run this camp. Well, thank you. And I have help. I have a I have a guy named Al yeah. who's in camp with me. Who's uh, he's been my assistant for the two camps now, and he's been a tremendous help. Al, the Lithuanian superstar. Yeah, he's uh, he is Lithuanian. super nice guy. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the um. You, you mentioned the sparring partners and watching um tape of the opponent. I think that's an interesting point that you mentioned, and I just want to highlight that for the fans because I don't think that a lot of people recognize that you could get a sparring partner that comes in with their own agenda, they're working on their own game plan, whatever. But it's important that the sparring partner is actually emulating the opponent for who for whom you're preparing. Yes. And what's that process like? Do they come in? Do, they, do these guys get it right? Well, away? I picked the style first of all. I look at videotape. Al helped me with that. He helped me find guys and <clears throat> find candidates out there that. First of all, you got to get the right size. You try to get the right height, the right reach, you know, close yeah. as you can get, the right weight. <clears throat> Once you get that, okay, show me video. I want to see the style. A uh, guy, you know, boom, two seconds. The guy's running all over. Forget it. That's next yeah. because this guy we're fighting is a physical, aggressive, gritty guy who's in front of you. Yeah. And he's looking for big punches. Uh, he's looking to come forward. He's looking to get to you. So right away, you know, you eliminate guys. Mm-hmm. The guy moves too much. This guy's a little too cute. Uh, you know, I, I want to get a more physical guy. I want a guy who's looking to uh, load up on right hands and left hooks. You know, and then you you see it, you see the guy that you think you, you're not going to see it perfect, but you see enough of that. And then you say, okay, let's try this guy. And then, you know, you say, okay, make a phone call, see if he's available. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're looking at his record, too. You're looking at who he's fought, how many rounds he's gone, how durable he's going to be, how durable he's been on his record will tell me how durable he can be in in camp. Yeah. You know, so you look at all those things. And then when I get him here, I sit down with him and I watch tape Mm -hmm. of the guy's you know, obviously of our opponent, and I, I let him see it. I say, you see what he's doing there? I'd like to see if we can do this. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see, can can you do this? And then during sparring, I remind them, hey, you know, I got two good guys here. One of them's name is Timor, and the other is Todd. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I yell out, Todd, I, I need more right-hand leads. Mm-hmm. All right, you got it. You know, so you... You uh, you stay on top of everything. I think that that's a big component that a lot of people probably don't appreciate is how important it is that the the sparring partner emulates the style that you're looking for and doesn't revert back to because again he's in there with a world class fighter that he's they're going to revert. The listen, champ. they're going to revert back. This is reality. Yeah. They're going to can they're going to revert back, but you you already know that their style is similar enough. You get the best you can. Yeah, you get most of it, and then the rest of it's up to you to to be going over to reinforce things yourself on the floor to where I'll go over things. Okay, uh, I will emulate what the opponent will right. do every day with my fighter to show. Him Okay, we gotta look out for this. We gotta look out for this. Let's go through the drills. And I would imagine you have to tell Alex to dial it back on some of these sparring partners because again, they're they're maybe contenders, young guys, whatever their case. No, no, may these be, guys are coming into these fight. guys are experienced. It depends well, what guys you got. The guys we got, we don't have to do that too much. Oh, they're, they're pretty experienced. Listen, sometimes do you have to do that? Yes. Uh, do you get in a situation where you have to dial it back? Yeah. We're not here to hurt nobody. Right. That's you know, what I was there's nobody say. You don't want to knock no, out your sparring uh, Listen, I use 18 ounce hand. gloves. A lot of guys don't uh, use okay, that. I okay. use 18 ounce gloves. Yeah. There's a reason for that. We're, we're okay. not here to win a decision. We're not here to get a purse. <laughs> we're, we're here to learn. Yeah. We're here to get prepared, not yeah. to hurt people. Right. So, you know, if we do, if you do catch a guy right, we let up. Gotcha. Well, listen, one of the topics that I want to talk to you about that's been uh, in the news lately, um, and you and I have... I'm going to tell you a story. Go ahead. There was a fighter, um, I'm not going to use a name, but there was a fighter, he was coming up, and on his way up, he was knocking everybody out. 
And what happened was the word got out that they had to they had to pay a lot extra for for small partners, mm-hmm. where the price of a small partner back in those days might have been five hundred a week. Uh, all of a sudden, it it went up to. <clears throat> Fifteen hundred, two thousand, which was unheard of. Yeah, unheard of. Like, whoa! And what's today's uh, price typically? Uh, well, it depends on who the guy is. It depends on you know uh, how tough he is. Spectrum, uh, it's, low to high. A thousand dollars, maybe. You okay. know, it could be a thousand bucks. It okay. could be eight hundred. It could yep. be you know somewhere okay. in that neighborhood. Okay. You know, depending again on. Listen, if you're if you're not making big purses, uh, obviously you, you can't pay as much. Yep. You know, it, it's it, everything's I relative. I so back in those days, it was unheard of to go over a thousand, and but they had to because you know this this guy was demolishing guys. He was a wrecking ball, and everyone thought it was so great. It was so great, and I remember one day in Gleason's gym. And the old Gleason's gym on 30th Street, I think it was 30th, between 7th and 8th Avenue. I was there for years after I left Catskill. And it was only about three blocks walk from Madison Square Garden. How great is that? You're training in a gym, you walk three blocks to the garden. <laughs> and and you got a guy fighting. How many times I did that? I trained guys during the day, and then I walked to the garden for a fight that night. Well, you're going to train, and you walk past the marquee, yeah. and reminded, uh, that's where... Oh, that's oh the cool. fell form, the old fell form. Oh, yeah. Now they call it the theater. Yeah. But it was the old fell form. And a lot of good fights there. And uh, so anyway, so, th- you know, this guy, the reputation was out. And he was just, you know, dropping guys all the time. And everyone thought it was so great. The, the manager, the, you know, the people around him, you know, all the, all the his supporters. Wow, this is great. This is great. And you know what? I didn't think it was so great. And, and part of it is because of my background being brought up with custom model. Understand the psyche and the other dimensions of it. But you know why I didn't think it was so great? Because they will, first of all, you're bringing guys in where you have an edge on them. Mm-hmm. You're, not, you're not knocking out guys that are number one contenders, number two contenders, number three, four, five, six contenders. You're not going to get out guys that are being paid to be small partners. Some of them are really good, but there's, there's a, there can be a big gap in between that. Some of them are very good, <laughs> right? So you... You're doing that. What are you? You're not making the guy develop beyond that. You're basically telling the guy that it's okay to be a bully. Yeah. And it's okay to take advantage and to have an advantage. And it's almost guaranteed you start to get a feeling that you're entitled to having an edge. Yeah. Guess what? One day you're going to get in the ring, you ain't going to have that edge. Yep. It's you. Yeah. And you're kind of telling them, like, we're fixing things where you always have an edge and you can always have your way. Guess what? Someday you get in that freaking place, you ain't having your way. Mm -hmm. You got to find the way. I'll say it again. You ain't having your way. I tell you that in life. You got to find a way. And if you don't teach a kid that when, when he's at a certain formative place in life as your child, as, as whatever he is, as that kid, he's going to get to a place where the lack of that lesson is going to hurt him. Mm-hmm. And the lack of that lesson in boxing hurt this guy and was going to hurt him. And I remember thinking, they're not doing him a favor by basically serving guys up on silver platters, you know, for him to demolish. Because, A, he thinks that it's always going to be this way, that he's entitled to having that edge. And, B, he never has to overcome anything. Mm-hmm. He, he never has pushback. Yeah. It, you know, if you're, getting, you, if you're getting ready to do a swim from one piece of land to another in the ocean, I think it would be a good idea if a wave hit you in the face once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I, I think that if you did all your swimming in a swimming pool that's, right. that's 85 degrees and the water's like this, 
I think you might have a problem when you get in the freaking ocean. <laughs> and I can I tell saw, you that from experience that and that I happens. Thought <laughs> when I watched this guy, he might have a problem when he gets in the ocean. And he did. Mm-hmm. And and again, it was people could say, well, he fell short, his talent only. No, he had talent. He had talent. What they they were not allowing him to develop, develop the rest of the package. Mm-hmm that he was going to always need sooner or later. You know, people talk about the neon talents, the, the power, the speed, the things that are so easy to, to see, to, to wrap your arm, head around. Oh, yeah, look how fast he is. Look at that footwork. Look at that. Look at that hand speed. Well, what about the talent of being reliable, dependable? Mm-hmm. What about that talent? That has to be developed. That's, that's not genetics. That has to be developed. That has to be worked. There has to be a, a training curve for that. There has to be an understanding for in life, period. There has to be an understanding of how do you get a guy to depend on himself, to know that he can depend on himself. You know how important that is just to know that you can depend on you? You know how many guys fought fights and they lost, but they won? Mm. Because in that fight, they found out they could depend on themselves. And then they went on three fights later and won the world title. Yeah. Because they found out that they could depend on themselves, which they didn't know. So I remember watching this guy and saying, he's going to have a problem. Mm. He's going to have a problem because one day he's going to be in there with a guy who's not there to get knocked out. Yeah. And he ain't going to know what to do. And that day came. So... I just wanted to say that. Yeah, well, one of the things that I want to talk to you about that's been in the news lately, recently, and you and I have touched on this on the previous shows, is um, first I want to talk about the heavyweight division and what's going on with the different alignments with Fury recently signing with Bob Arum and ESPN. And after we touch on that specifically, then come back a full circle to touch on the whole structure of the way promoters are now aligning themselves with networks and the challenges it presents to the to the to boxing as a whole and primarily to the fans because ultimately we want to see the fights we want to see but with everyone aligning with networks and people kind of you know putting their flag in the ground and 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 making these alignments it's how I want, I want to talk to you specifically about how difficult it becomes to make these fights but first let's talk about fury signs with um espn and bob arum i want to share a couple of thoughts and then i want to hear what you have to think uh, what, sorry what you have to say um so obviously these guys have um great fight a draw seems like a, um a, a reasonable decision given the fight in my opinion um But it looks like an obvious no-brainer to make this rematch, settle this dispute, and have the winner fight uh, Anthony Joshua. I think that the boxing community, boxing fans in general, like would all agree, this is what people want to see. And it's interesting to me because Fury signs with Bob Arum and ESPN. Now, what's important to note is that Fury, if I'm not mistaken, got gave, dollars, gave right? his entire, I think so. For five fights. Yeah. I believe that's what it is. Keep in mind, too, the one thing I want to point out, Fury gave, according to all accounts and himself included, gave his prize purse for the first fight with Wilder to charity. He seems like a very, he doesn't seem to be motivated. I've heard him say in the press, I'm not motivated by money. I have all the money I'll ever need. I'm interested in legacy. So he's and not going to take the hundred million they gave him. So it, this is uh, what I'm getting to. So he he gives away his whole purse. So he says, and now he signs with Bob Arum and ESPN. There's no way he could give that hundred million. <laughs> I know a couple of good charities yep. that will truly, truly, truly help the needy. Yeah, but we'll I don't come, think we'll I don't think that. that's going to happen. So I'm he's just now signing with I'm ESPN guessing. and Arum, and sure enough, as soon as it was announced, doesn't make me the amazing question. <laughs> as soon as it was announced. You could already hear people, yourself included, said to me, I don't think this fight is happening. I don't think this rematch is happening. And lo and behold, they announce it's not happening. And personally, it, it's, it's, I find it to be incredibly frustrating. Well, you didn't have to go to fight. MIT to figure that one out. <laughs> I, I, you didn't have to graduate MIT. I graduated PS27. <laughs> And I, get why, I, I figure I, that one out. I, get I mean, you give someone, an you give, listen, him. it's not a knock on anyone. We're, uh, we're talking straight stuff here. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's business. Yeah, It ain't personal, Ken. Mm-hmm. It's business. You know, uh, like they said in that great movie, and I love, I just love referencing movies. I really enjoy that because movies can be so true to life sometimes, yeah. you know. But 
listen, you give someone a hundred million dollars, uh, and you put a certain amount of fights attached to getting that, you know, actually being able to get to that hundred million dollars, guess what? You want to go down the road to get to that hundred million dollars, you know? And again, you don't have to graduate MIT to know if you give someone a hundred million dollars, rather than take a rematch with a guy who dropped him two times that could risk him getting to that place, it, it does, it's not good business. It doesn't make sense. They wouldn't have signed the $100 million deal if that's the route they wanted to go. You know, and you could say all you want. Oh, gee, if they make that rematch, it could be $30 million, it could be $40 million, whatever you want to, whatever numbers you want to put on it, whatever. But it's not $100 million. And there's, there's risk that the party ends if he gets caught. Don't forget, he was laying flat on his back and then he jumped up. Mm. If he gets caught, maybe just a little bit different. Just a fraction of an inch this way and a fraction of, of a millimeter this way. Maybe he doesn't get it. Maybe he wins the fight too. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying, it's business. And once you knew that that was a deal made, that fight... If you're a reasonable guy and you don't like to lie to yourself and play games with yourself and live in La La Land, you know, I'd like to live in La La Land, but uh, I mean, I, I can't find it. Mm. I, I mean, it, uh, and, and still take care of my family. I wish I could, but, you know, um, you have to live in, in Realsville. You know, and Realsville tells you that if, you know, if, hey, if somebody's fortunate enough and Fury earned it, he's fortunate enough to get paid that kind of money, uh, he's, there's a plan. And the, the plan is to take certain fights to get to, to try to get to that place. And, you know, and is, is that what the fans want to hear? And uh, no, but it, it's a, you know, it's a reality. And, and also there's, there's things in the way. I mean, there's, you know, everyone's got different promoters, so it, it's not that easy. A lot of times the fans will say, why can't that fight be made with that fight? And that fight be made with that. And not all fans, because most fans are pretty educated. But, well, because that fight is with him, and that fight is with him, and the, so the fight can't be made, you know. because that, And because that fighter who's with him, the promoter over there, whoever ex-promoter is over there, is with ex network and that fight over there is with Wyatt network and yeah. so they, they're going to stay on their piece of property and they're going to stay on their piece of property you know um, back in the old days when Don King controlled everything and listen there was something wrong with that Yeah. <laughs> but one thing was being that he controlled everybody you could make uh, you could make some fights because he, he was going to win no matter what to his famous words, and they're infamous words, and it's not nice stuff that he that some of this was attached to. But you know, when he was controlling all the heavyweights, and he was able to make the fights because he had both sides. Um, like he said that night, that Joe Frazier, the great late Joe Frazier, was undefeated. At, you know, uh, he had beaten Ali. In the fight of the century, right? He was going to fight a young, undefeated fighter that was an Olympian named George Foreman. Uh, a lot of people didn't know much about him. Mm -hmm. They saw a picture of him holding a flag, but they didn't really know much about Big George. And um, Joe Frazier, you know, King goes, like he said, his words. He's, he went with Joe Frazier to that fight. I believe it was in the Philippines against George Foreman. Mm -hmm. And he's defending his title, Joe Frazier's the world champion undefeated, and he's fighting George Foreman. And like King said, I went to the arena with the champion, and I left the arena with the champion. Because <laughs> when Joe Frazier got knocked out, brutally knocked out, uh, he left the arena with the other guy. Yeah. With, with, uh, with George. So, but, you know, those... And nowadays, it's, in some ways, you know, it's... It's different, but it's the same. I mean, you, everyone has their piece of the pie, so to speak, that owns these different areas that they have fighters. And those are the areas for the most part, unless there's a special situation where there's enough money involved, where both promoters, both networks can get together, 
You know, the first time that happened, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, and I'm I'm jumping around a little bit, but I don't. I hope the fans uh, stay with me and and they don't mind that, and they like going down the, the trivia road a little bit and journey with me. But I think the first time that they got together that way might have been Lennox Lewis and Tyson mm -hmm. in Tennessee, where they put that fight on and where the the, the two different promoters, uh, two different networks agreed to you know, come together. And then, of course, the next time, the next real big one was Pacquiao and Mayweather. Mm -hmm. well, again, when two different networks, two different promoters, it was big enough. Uh, they made concessions. They made, you know, they made deals where, okay, you'll be on, uh, be on our network, but we'll use your commentators, you know, whatever the deal was. Yeah. And, and they worked it out. But other than that, you know, you stay on your property and I'll stay on my property. Don't come on my property. <laughs> I get, I get uh, ESPN and Aram's motivation signing Tyson Fury. He's, he's a big draw and he's a charismatic. I mean, I find him to be incredibly And you know who they should thank? Who's that? See, we talk boxing things that don't normally get talked. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we turn it inside out. Mm -hmm. And we do. And we, we, we talk things that normally you, you, you're not going to really, you're not going to hear it. We're in the barbershop, baby. You know what I mean? The old days where, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, where you could get real stuff. You know, but when Fury should be thanking Canelo and his people for getting the deal they got. They should send a Christmas card to Canelo. In every, the zone. Every, yeah, in the zone, D-A-Z-N. Send a Christmas card to him. How do you say Merry Christmas in Spanish? Feliz Navidad. There it is. And I love the sound of that. <laughs> say it again. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> Feliz Navidad. It's beautiful. Yeah. They should be singing that to, Fury should be singing that to Canelo and his people as often as possible. Because if the Canelo deal, 330 million for 11, 365, I think. So, what's a couple? <laughs> come on. <yeah. laughs> I mean, you know, all right. So, even bigger. $365 million for what? 11 fights? Something like that? 10 or 11. All right. So, if that deal doesn't come down the pike, that historic deal doesn't come down the pike, then there's no motivation. For there's no competition. If that restaurant doesn't open up across the street, guess what? Then this restaurant doesn't have to be better. Yeah. They don't have to make sure that their fettuccine Alfredo is fresh. You might get fettuccine Alfredo that's not fresh. Mm -hmm. You could get sick. Yeah. You get sick. Be careful. So it's just it's it's what <laughs> it's what makes the world go around. It's what makes America the greatest. The competition. So ESPN then comes up and Aram, you know, they're, they're smart. They come up and they say, hey, we got to compete. We're, we're all trying to get viewers on the app, right? It's all about the apps now. Yeah. It's all about not the abs. Not the, <laughs> I know you, it's for you, it's all about the apps. <laughs> it's about the apps, baby. But, but for these people, it's about the apps. Yep. And it's all about that streaming, streaming. streaming. I know that. I can say that. Right. Ask me how to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't happening. <laughs> yeah, okay? But, yeah. So it's all about getting that audience, that market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they come up with that deal, and then ESPN has to jump in the waters and say, hey, we got our app, too. We want to stay competitive. We got to sign a name, too. Mm -hmm. And presto, $100 million, you know, Aaron uh, comes with the idea. And $100 million now, we'll sign up a name. You know, they have Canelo. Well, who can we do comparable? There's no one comparable to Canelo and, because and Anthony Joshua is yeah. already with the and, zone, and Joshua's so he's not always available. There. So we got to get we 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 got to catch up. We got to get in the game, babe. Mm -hmm. So the hundred million dollars comes up to get Fury. So again, that deal comes because of this deal. Mm -hmm. The the competitive, what's going on now? The competition for that market. Yeah. And that's what's going on. But when you do that, when a network gives that kind of money, you know, they're not giving that kind of money and say, okay, uh, you know, even though the fans might love the idea, and I'm with you, guys, I'm with you, they might love the idea. Let's fight Wilder right away. Well, no, you gave them $100 million. We, we want them on our air fighting. 
we want him on air for five times to get him to have a chance to recoup our money or at least yeah. to build our audience. That's why we paid him. We we don't want to go into the casino and 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 take all our chips and say yeah. Put it on red, babe. <laughs> no, no. We we want to play for a while. Yeah. And that's what it is. You know, and you could be out there for, you know, uh, all kinds of places trying to figure it out. And this, what we're talking about is what it's about. It's been interesting see this, seeing this play out because I thought that when Fury and Wilder fought I, and they and they fought to a draw, I, I, I seriously, in the last three weeks, the, the, the dynamics have changed so much. I thought, oh, Joshua's on the outside looking in now. He seemed like he was in the driver's seat. Now these guys are obviously going to rematch and Joshua's going to have to take another fight. He might be waiting for a while. And next thing you know, it looks like now Wilder's the, on the outside looking in without a deal and Fury's got the money, but... The thing that I find surprising is Fury's come out and say, I gave away my whole purse. I'm not about money. I'm about legacy. But then to sign that deal, like I get why Aram and ESPN want it, but I don't understand why Fury for his own legacy, if he, if in fact he has all the money he'll ever need, which he probably does, why wouldn't he want the fight? And again, I get the business side of it, but it's just frustrating for the fans, my, myself included, because I, because, seems, he, because he does want money. Yeah. Don't Cle tell, uh, clearly, don't tell anyone. Clearly. He does want yeah, money. Clearly. I mean, it's one thing to give out a beautiful soundbite at a press conference. Yeah. And I'm not knocking the guy. I like yeah, the guy. I do, too. I like him. But I'm just in Wheelsville here. Oh, yeah. That's all. Well, the actions <laughs> and, speak louder and, than words. Yeah, you can well, say actions, all you want, yeah, but the actions but, but, are saying, you know, I want the money. Yeah, but, I don't want this fight. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, he he also wants to have uh, the ability to... Um, Take care of his family, as, as whatever, and take and have the things that he wants to have in life. And hey, listen, I always say it. I will say it again. Anyone who gets in that ring for a living, you can't make enough money. For yeah. me, I I don't begrudge anyone. You can get it if you can get it. Get it. Yep. If you can get. You, you know, know, I'm I'm not arguing that he but, shouldn't get it, but it's it's frustrating. I get that it. We're not going to get to see. What seemingly everyone hey, you wanted to the change. Participants you wanted to change. I'll tell you how it changes. Let's forget about all this banter back and forth about, oh, oh I wish it was this way. <laughs> <laughs> it's not this way. <laughs> forget all that. That's again, Reelsville. You know how it changes? Make make boxing the UFC. Get Dana White. It's not happening, but he's a dictator. Yeah. You know what? Dictators usually are not good. Mm. But sometimes, in some places, they can be useful. Mm. With the USFC and the building of that product, the development, the building, the growing of that franchise, and boy, did it grow, was because they had a dictator. Because the dictator could make all the rules. There were no, as I just pointed out, there were no, you know, separate power brokers in different areas that had their piece of property and their piece of property and their piece of property and the, we fight, we, we fight on our network, we fight on our network, we fight on our network and we do what we want to do. No, there was one place, one guy laying the rules out. You fight him or you're out. You fight him or you're out. And you know what? That's why he grew that sport, and that's why he grew that product, because he could demand competitive fights. That's what you're asking for. You're that's just right. asking for the best fights. That's it. That's what the fans want. That's what I'm with wants. you, but I'm just pointing out, he could do it because he was a dictator. He, he could go and say, you're fighting him, and you're fighting him, and you're fighting him, and, you're, and that's it. And he was able to do that. Because it was, he was the power. He was the one guy. There were no other options, no other places to go. So it was my way or the highway. So he was able to put on the fence with one of the things that grew the sport was, hey, you watch UFC? Yeah, it's a little brutal. It's a little brutal for me. No, no, no. I'm telling you, it's a little brutal. It is this, but they got skills. They got, and they're always competitive fights. They were, really? Yeah, they're always good. You're not seeing like one guy like as soon as he, you know, before the national anthem's over, you know who's winning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the national anthem was tougher than a fight. Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. And and you you can see that in boxing. You know, I mean, yep. it's, it's it happens. But 
for the most part, it didn't happen in the UFC when he was growing up because he knew what he was doing. He knew what he could do. He knew what he could demand. He could demand those kind of matches, and the fans would be satisfied. They would go away saying, oh, oh, oh that was World War II. Well, next week, World War Three. Next week, World War Four, because you knew what you were going to get. Yeah. And he could do that. And you know, unless you have that, you ain't going to have it in boxing. But unless you have that, you ain't having Nirvana that we're, we're talking about here. And boxing is the one sport that doesn't have a dictator. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soften it. They don't have a czar. They don't have a national commission. All the other sports do. The NFL, you know, the NFL, you get a lot of competitive games. You get your blowouts, don't get me wrong, but you get a lot of competitive games and you have parity for the most part. If it gets out of whack, boom, there's a rule put in place to get parity. Why? Because there's a commission that makes sure. Why? For the survival and the benefit of the sport. The sport. And that's what Dana White was about. It was, yeah, he was part of it. Don't get me wrong. He benefited. But it was about the survival and the benefit and the growing of the sport. Not one guy. Not, not just one set of fighters. And in the NFL, it's about the survival and the growth and the development of the sport. That's why they're going to London. They're going around the world, globalizing their sport. But they knew that if it was just about a couple of owners having the best teams, if they didn't make those rules where it was it demanded parity, where we're putting salary caps and doing whatever they had to do, luxury tax, whatever, baseball, whatever, if they didn't do that, yeah, New England would win every year. They don't win every year, by the way. I know almost, you're, almost. I know you're a rapid <laughs> maniac New England fan, uh, but they don't. Now they don't. They, now they're even trying to frame uh, Bob Kraft. <laughs> well, Pope let's Kraft. not get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we. Okay, so <laughs> you go and in football, like I said. You you have a commission, so his job is to make sure the whole sport grows, not just Robert yeah. Kraft. Not, you know, otherwise it would be about Jerry Jones and Robert Kraft. It would be you know about the most powerful, richest guys. But no, it's not because there's rules put in place. There 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 is a safeguard to make sure that the the growth of the sport continues. The benefit of the sport comes before the benefit of of, of one promoter or or one owner. Here's so, a quick but, question. Quick question on that topic. We have governing bodies that award these belts. Let's just use WBC. But let me WBC, finish one thing. Okay, go ahead. What what I'm saying is, like we talk about, like a fighter can avoid a fighter. Yeah. All right. In the NFL, perfect example. Most people haven't thought about it this way, but Brady is good as they are, right? They they can't say, I want to avoid New Orleans next year because Drew Brees is dangerous. <laughs> Actually, no, the tougher you play him, no, the more no, likely but, you're going to get to get yeah, that matchup. But you can't avoid him. No. The point is you can't do what you do in boxing. There's a commission saying, no, you can't do that. Yep. Well, I want to avoid the Green Bay Packers because uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers could beat us. <laughs> yeah, he could. And, and that's what our fans are looking forward to, yeah. the possibility. That. So... That's why a commission is important, but we don't have one, an uh, overall national commission. Years ago, I traveled down with ESPN to interview Senator John McCain about getting a national commission. A lot of people don't know this. And I went down there with the sole purpose of getting him on board to help us get a national commission because of everything I'm talking about. When I talk about the corruption with the judges, when I talk about the corruption with, you know, with the different facets of the game that hurt the fighters, hurt the sport, hurt the fan, chase the fans, I said, let me put my money where my mouth is. Instead of just talking about it, yelling about it, let me see if I could do something. So we made an arrangement. I went down there and I met with him. I interviewed him and talked to him about getting a national commission. Um, he was on board. He was on board. Uh, we did some things. We started to travel down that road. Someday on another show, I'll get more into some of the some of the potholes and hurdles that really stopped it. But basically, we started going down the road, and he did enact some legislator uh, um, legislation. Uh, he started uh, a little before that, actually. He started the Muhammad Ali Act. Yeah which was helpful, but mm -hmm. uh, like the great Jack Newfield, who I miss every day, was a great journalist and a great defender of the underdog. Great man. 
as he once said to me, it was okay, but it was kind of like giving chicken soup for something that needed antibiotics. Yeah. You know, yeah, it made yeah. you feel good. It made you feel good. Like <sighs> we got the alley act now. Okay. But what do you really have? Like it, it didn't, it didn't kill the virus. Yeah. It didn't kill the virus. And so, but like I said, it went to the point where he set me up with his people. We started putting a structure together. We talk, started talking about who could be a boxing czar, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I mean, we really started talking about, it. but then a little thing, I don't know how the heck he let this take precedent over it. Really? I, I still don't understand, mm -hmm. but a little thing like, so you get an opportunity to run for president of the United <laughs> States, and and guess what? All all his efforts went into that, yeah. and and this kind of got left alone a little bit. And he cared about boxing, McCain. He did. He cared about it. Not not. I used to get pissed. I I even talked to him about it. I said, you know what pisses me off? That you guys in government, you cared so much about baseball and the people in baseball when you had a problem yeah. that the president got involved. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. really, yeah. and and you, you you cared about it. You can't. You uh, what? Nobody cares about our people. Uh -huh. Nobody cares about our guys uh, in boxing. Uh, start caring. So he did care about it. And like I said, we did travel down that road, and we did try to put the, the idea was to put a national commission together. Uh -huh. That was the idea, but. There was something, someday we'll talk more about it, but there was some adversaries in the bushes. There, <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. There, was, there was a few people in there, that politicians that I don't think were on the up and up. Yeah. You're I, kidding, politicians. Yeah, there was a few politicians. I didn't think they were on the up <laughs> Might and up. Might be the only and, dirtier business than and, boxing. And when McCain had to take it to the next place because he can't do it himself, yeah. it, we started having a few problems, and it never got to that next place. And again, he ran for president of the United States, and he had bigger fish to fry, you know? And and it kind of got... It didn't go to the place that I was hoping it would go to. But that's the hope. If If these things were to be remedied that we're talking about, that's the way to do it. But talk to me about the sanction and bodies. Like, let's say again, let's use the WBC as an example, just to pick a random one. So WBC, someone has the title and then they have mandatory challengers and they, they demand certain fights or you'd be stripped of the belt. Like they seem to be like toothless tigers. They, I mean, they, they, they are not toothless tigers, not so, the, not the alphabet organizations. I mean, they, you know, they, they work with, you know, they they work. They they see who the champion is and what money he brings in. They get, they get a fee from every time he defends the title. You know, and they can mandate who you have to fight. Mm -hmm. So if you have a relationship, if a manager has a relationship with with a certain organization or runs that organization, but people don't realize they have that a certain relationship with them. All of a sudden, their guy. You know, you have you theoretically you're supposed to do it on merit. You, you you win certain fights, you move up in the ratings. But somehow, I don't know, somehow miraculously, some guys whoop, they jump up a little bit. But that's you ever played checkers? You ever <laughs> played checkers where you could do, do double jumps? Yep. Okay, there's double jumps. There's a lot of double jumps <laughs> in in boxing. Okay, and all of a sudden a guy will jump up to a mandatory position. So now if there was a relationship with the manager that helped that jump take place, now all of a sudden that guy uh, is a mandatory to fight for a title where the champion, you know, has to, has to fight him. Theoretically, there's ways around it. But if you are in, for instance, if the WBO and the WBC that has two separate champions, why wouldn't it be so obvious that the the other fighter is obviously the number one challenger to the belt. Like the WBC champ should be the number one contender for the WBO belt and vice versa. Why aren't those fights because not they made? All, because what we talked about with the promoters, they all have their pieces of property and everyone wants to make their money on their pieces of property. Why doesn't the sanction body demand like, hey, will you have the WBO belt? Guy, fighter X Because they're WBC. separate entities because they all have their own agendas. They, they all, you know, they have different powers and forces that they that they answer to too you know that they're beholden to you know they got a group of guys that they have relationships with the these fighters who are managed by these guys and it works for them it, they have relationships those relationships uh 
sometimes prosperous for them in certain ways, okay, without getting too deep into it. So they have their group of guys, you know. I mean, and and this this group over here, whatever what they are, they have their group of guys. So it makes sense for them to have these guys as their top guys, and it makes sense, you know, usually the same names are in their different order for the most part. But then these guys have their own group of guys that make sense because it makes sense. It seems more rare than ever to have anyone unify any titles. I think right now the only weight class that's unified is uh, cruiserweight, where uh, Usyk, Ukrainian kid, has all the belts. Uh, it just seems like that's not it, that used to happen. I feel like f- more, somewhat more frequently, but now it just seems there's so many belts, so many titles, so many sanctioning bodies, and obviously everyone's collecting their fees. To, if you want to be ranked, you've got to pay. It's a, a fee business, rate. but Ken, it's a business. Should it be? Should it be eliminated? I think so. Should it be pulled back on? I think so. Should it be, you know, tampered down tremendously? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But where's the National Commission demanding Mm. that that happens? Mm. No one's going to, if there's no one to demand it, they're not going to do, you think one of these heads of the organizations that gets a percentage every time one of these guys fight a lucrative purse, you think they're going to say, I, Okay, Ken, I listened to you and Teddy's podcast. <laughs> yeah, you know, it really kept me up last night. You know, it did. It, it wasn't a Reuben sandwich that I ate from Harvey's Deli. It, it, it was my conscience. It, my conscience really it, it kept me up. And you know what? I'm I'm not going to do what I do anymore. I'm not going to do it this way anymore. It's going to be all about merit. It's not going to be it's not going to be about, you know, agendas or relationships or about making money for myself. You know, I I could do without a third swimming pool. I mean, really. <laughs> two of them's enough. I'm just surprised that there hasn't been um a a a, a neutral body that's um neutral started, body like, who can who <clears throat> Oh, you yeah. need a national commission. I just told you. Yeah. The NFL, MLB, NHL, all right, NBA. Why do they continue to prosper? Because their concentration is on what's the benefit of the game, for the benefit of the game, and of course the fans. Because without the fans, you don't have a game. So they understand we have to keep parity. We, we have to put certain rules in order to keep that parity, to make sure one guy doesn't have all the wealth, to make sure that, that these rules are not overridden, that somebody doesn't find a way, you know, just to control things, uh, where it's only good for them. It has to be good for the whole sport. So there's a national commission put in place, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that there's rules and they adhere to, right? And, and that, the roadmap you're following, where you're looking to go, is what's best to grow the sport. Not one franchise, but we just explained it. There is no guy there to do that in this sport. There is no policeman. This is the Wild West still, to a certain extent. I think with the rise with, with of no these sheriff. streaming services is making it more of a Wild West than it ever was before. And one of the ones that I want to speak about specifically and just get your thoughts on, and, and I know you've been involved with ESPN for a number of years, and I know that they desperately want to compete and provide good products. I think they sincerely do and they want to provide a good product with ESPN Plus and the streaming service. But one of the one of the arrangements that I question the 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 decision making in and not necessarily the um, ethics because I think that ESPN again wants to deliver the best product so they've done a deal with Bob Arum and I just want to play devil's advocate for a minute and again this you could see this take uh, could be a cynical view but let's say ESPN wants to get into boxing Bob Arum has a stable of fighters he's known to put on he very capable of producing events, putting on fights. So I think they gave him, uh, I could be off on the numbers here, I apologize if it's not bang on accurate, but let's say they gave him $70 million for the next five to seven years to put on X amount of fights, let's say 50 dates a year. So they give him the money, ESPN, best intentions, Bob Arum says, wow, that's a lot of fights, but like a lot of things in business, you just you know, fake it till you make it. Okay, I think I can do that. I don't have all those fighters right now, but I'm going to commit to doing that. And you're trying to do it on the fly, just like with the Tyson Fury. You sign them up, hoping that you can find opponents and you, you can make entertaining fights. 
But again, just to play devil's advocate, they put all their faith, they put all their eggs in one basket, and Bob Arum's going to deliver all these fights. And all of a sudden, Bob Arum has all this power, and ESPN and all their executives are almost beholden to Bob Arum. They've put, they've aligned themselves with him, whatever he says, go. Now you have one guy who's in control of a major network, more or less, in terms of their boxing content. And it's almost like whatever he says goes, including signing someone like Tyson Fury and putting him in there with opponents that people really don't want to see. There's some boxing purists that are going to tune in to see him fight, you know, uh, a mop. As we've well, discussed, listen, part of part of the <clears throat> part of the value of of Fury is his entertainment value. It's not just his boxing. It's very approach. entertaining. I yeah, like I mean that. that's part of it. Listen, there's a fine line between entertainment and being a clown. You have yeah. to be careful. Right. You have to be careful. Yeah. You do, and he it has is, done some clownish things. Yeah, you have to be, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. But his personality, his story, it's a good story, you know. And then listen, don't think race don't come into it. I mean, he's a white guy in in a predominantly sport that's predominantly the best guys are black, mm -hmm. uh, Hispanic, uh, especially in the heavyweight division. Uh, some of them, uh, so a lot of the top guys are. So don't think, you know, we wish. I know, I wish that we didn't have to think that way anymore, you know, in, in this year, uh, that we're in of, uh, 2019. But uh, it, it still matters to some people. And, uh, and I think that it's a novelty to a certain extent that, uh, hey, you got a heavyweight who talks, he's white and he, so that's part of the entertainment. That's part of the value. But he also is a big giant guy that's pretty agile in the ring. You know, he can slip punches. He's got good defensive abilities. He showed that to the most part against Wilder. And he's got a good story behind him, gypsy and all that stuff and where he comes from. And so the entertainment is part of it. You know, I mean, Tyson was making his living at the end when he wasn't good anymore. But he was making it because of what the possible entertainment value you were going to get when you paid for him. That that you might see something like a little ridiculous. You mm. might see him pick up somebody and throw him out of the ring. You might see him, <laughs> you know, he might bite a guy's head off if, if he could or get his, his if he could get his mouth open that wide. Yeah. But he couldn't. You know, it was just big enough for the smaller things, the mm. appendages. Mm. That's the proper way of saying yeah. it. Appendages. <laughs> you know, but he. You know, so part of his value, Tyson's value at that point, wasn't his athletic ability or who he was fighting so much in the ring. It was about what people perceived as a curiosity, a, yeah. a entertainment, a morbid curiosity in his case. Um, but with Fury, again, you know, they're, they're buying heavyweight, they're buying uh, entertainment. You know, as part of it, and and again, a big guy that he doesn't know what he's doing in the ring, and. They're also, they're competing. Again, they're competing for a slice of the market, a slice of the market, the, the streaming market, the app market that they have to compete against with the zone. No, I get all that. My question is, what is what 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 is the benefit of aligning with a promoter? Do you think that the, the executives at different networks, and I'm not trying to pick on ESPN, and pick anyone, that they're well, they aligning all have with one a, with guy, a, but all of them have one guy. I understand, I understand what you're saying, but Fox, why Fox, not just make the Fox, fights that make Fox, sense? Fox and Showtime basically have one guy. Well, Fox especially, uh, Heyman. Yeah, uh, the Zone yep. has Hearn. Yeah, you know Eddie Hearn from London. You know, so so they all basically have one guy. And listen, when HBO was in business, well, you didn't think they were aligned with one guy or two guys, uh, uh, Golden Boy or whoever it was that was their... No, I understand uh, that, but I'm wondering favorite, why doesn't ESPN stay guy? neutral and just try to make the best fights from a promoter? Do you think it's because someone at the network doesn't want to accept listen, responsibility used to, for doing listen, that? Listen, ESPN had that for years. For, for 18 years, I called the Friday Night Fights. Yeah. And for the most part, we had that. We we would put, basically, the idea was put the fights up to the best bid. Yeah. You know, to use all the promoters out there. Mm -hmm. And whoever offered you the best fight, bang, bingo. Yeah. You got the show. Yeah. And, and you know, for the most part. But when you're doing that, then the, the, the dependability factor becomes a little difficult. Because now you're not sure what you're going to get, you know, even though theoretically you're going to get the best matches because you have competition like we were talking about before. It's so important. But the dependability factor was at risk 
because now you aren't sure if a promoter, you say you got six promoters, you weren't sure if if each time you went around the horn to these different guys and tried to keep the mix going and try to get the most competitive bid, so to speak. You weren't sure if you could depend on them coming up with it all the time. Uh, so there was a there was a worry, and there would be a worry, an inherent worry, if you will, that can all the going around to different shops, can they, can they always have what you need? Yeah. And then kind of like Costco. Costco comes along and all the little hardware stores and all the other little stores that were always great to go to, all of a sudden they, they get a little bit obsolete because you could go to Costco and do one 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 shopping, yeah. you know, one-time shopping. So that's kind of what Aram, where they said, okay, we'll go with a known commodity, with a known entity, you know, of Aram with top rank for years, been around, and we know that we can depend on getting getting a, uh, the Name product fighters. yeah getting getting the product that he's been able to put out there you know in the places that he's been able to put it out there that we're we're going to be able to get that level uh of service so to speak yeah. that that level of, of a product uh and we don't have to shop around we we have it in house mm -hmm. and and that's that's where that thinking comes from you know and you could understand it. But my fear I'm, I'm is that to play it, devil's I'm not saying it's is, infallible. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You're giving one person a lot of latitude to make the fights fans want to see. And it's his best. It's in his best interest to build up his own fighters, to put on the fights he wants to see fight for the betterment of his stable. I hear what you're and you, there's a lot of room for discrepancy there. And again, I know this is sensitive subject. We want to um, be sensitive to all the relationships involved. But it's just. The, the whole picture it seems very muddy and cloudier than ever. And I got to say, if this Fury Wilder well, doesn't look like it's going to happen, but what well, a time shame. Listen, what a time, shame. Ken, time tells everything. Yeah. Yep. You got to go down the road a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, yeah. in all fairness, you got to go down the road. So you go down the road, and at the end of the day, you know, time, time has a way of... Uh, of showing you things and telling, mm -hmm. you know, telling whether or not your thoughts were accurate or not accurate. Yeah. So, yeah, time will tell. Uh, I don't think we're going to reach any conclusions here today. So let's leave this topic for another discuss another time and um, get to this week's guest. All right. We're joined by a very special guest. And before I introduce this man, I'd like to read a few of his statistics just to give context to how impressive this young man is. Amateur record, 396 wins in one loss. The one person who was lucky enough to beat him on points, he avenged that loss two times. World championships, silver in 07, gold in 09, gold in 2011. Olympics, gold in 08, gold in 2012 in London. Ranked pound for pound best fighter in the world by ESPN, The Ring Magazine, and writers, the Boxing Writers Association of America. He won his third world title in just his third professional fight, tying a world record. Became a two-weight division world champion in only his seventh pro fight, winning the junior lightweight world title. In his, seventh, in his 12th pro fight, he won the lightweight world title. In addition to boxing, he's also trained in traditional Ukrainian dance and gymnastics. We're talking about none other than the great Vasily Lomachenko. Welcome, Hello. champ. Thank you. Hello. You had me at Fazili. <laughs> Remember that movie with Tom Cruise? Yeah. With, uh, what was it, Jerry Maguire? Yeah, yeah. You had me at Hello. <laughs> you had me at Fazili. That's enough. Well, 396 and one is an impressive amateur record because, as you know, Teddy, in the amateurs, there's a lot of room for uh, discrepancies there. To have almost 400 fights and only one time, the judges get it wrong. He's a special guy. <laughs> I'd say he's uh, very special. Well, listen, thanks for being here, champ. Really appreciate it, and thank you for bringing these beautiful belts. Uh, I know that these are special edition belts, especially the WBO belt. Um, hey, I guess you want to tell us a little bit about that one. This is manager, by the way, Agus Clemens, who has the best stable. I think he's the best manager in the business, and he's got the best stable in the business. He's got four world champions, and he's got a line, a line of other guys waiting to fill in to be world champions. Not 
not to mention because of the best fighters. That's why yeah. I, I'm a best manager, because I have the best guys. Yeah. They are the best, not me. If they wouldn't be doing what they do, I wouldn't be in my position. But they are very established, very... Um, how I can describe that, you know, they, when they come here, they know what they want, they know what they're doing, and that's what makes me the best. It's not me. It's you got them. the best. If you got the best stable. If it's in a business, a lot of people would um, would be envious and are envious to have a stable like that. It's uh, four world champions, and the guys that you're waiting to bring in next, that you're maneuvering next, there you got guys that are world champion amateurs and. Uh, they're going to fill into world champion slots too. But uh, you... And, I, and, and a bunch of Ukrainians, they, they must be drinking some special water in the mountains over there. <laughs> they, you know, and, and you have special people around them too. His father's special. Very special. You very know? special, yes. And that, that's, you know, I think, I think that's what, you no know, his father helped for that Ukrainian team when they were to Olympics. That's what... Um, I got you know, most of the, most of that team came you know to me to work together. You know, he was uh, Vasily was the very first one to join. You know, to join, and then after him, you know, came Gvozdik, Usyk, and you know. So I call him the machine. I call his father the professor. <laughs> uh, he calls himself a different. He calls like a, him and his father. He calls a, it's a kind of like a video game. He's just a, like a little piece in a, uh, on, on a screen and his father with a joystick is a controls everything. Everything his father wants to go controls him and that's where he goes. It's hard to argue with the success they've had together. And before we get into that, because I want to talk more to the relationship you have with your dad, but you were telling me before we went live about this special edition WBO belt that they had made for um, Vasily. Um, I think, what did you say, they had it made in Thailand, special edition? Yeah, that's what the president uh, of a WBO told me when he brought that belt. You know, it's a special edition made belt for the super champion and uh uh, they they do those belts in Thailand, I believe. This is kind of like it's not just a, like a, uh, just stones. It's not like a special, yeah, real this is diamonds. Special, the real diamonds, and uh, oh, it's beautiful. And uh, you know, as far as I know, it's kind of like sixty-five thousand dollar to to make it. Those kind of a belts, and but. Uh, WBO, it's, you know, they, they likes him and they, they do that. Yeah, well, he's a special guy. We had to twist his arm to get him to bring the belts here. Very humble guy, very quiet, reserved. But what I want to talk to um, is a little bit, I want to get into your amateur career and kind of walk through your career from the beginning, starting with the amateurs. How old were you when you initially started boxing? And was it your dad, was your dad a boxer before you? And how did you get involved in the sport? No, I don't have a, I don't have a chance and I don't have a uh, Weber choose. I didn't have the choice. I didn't have a choice because my, my father uh, is a coach. My father is a trainer. He showed me this beautiful sport. He teach me boxing. I love this game. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why, that's why I start training boxing. Your father had a plan. Yeah. From the I time think, you were born. Yeah, I think. Yeah. It was very similar to, in the United States, obviously a different sport, but Tiger Woods' father with the golf. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods' father had a plan that when he was born, he was going to be the greatest golfer ever. And he had a plan to make that happen. He had exercises for him. He started him very young. He had a process that he was going to put him through all the way through. Your father did the same thing. You no, know, I, I have a very interesting story, but I, I uh, explain you in Russian. Yeah. I, I guess translate, sure. okay? It was, I think, 1993 or всеукраинский турнир, и на этом турнире в одной комнате собрались, тогда только появились у нас эти камеры, видеокамеры, и тогда в этой комнате собрались там все ребята с, с области, с нашего региона, и каждого записывали, спрашивали, 
а кто кем хочет стать в будущем. В общем, всех спросили ребят, все рассказали. Потом очередь дошла до моего отца. Он тогда был молодой начинающий тренер. И ты у него спросили, а, а что вы хотите? Он говорит, я хочу, чтобы в нашем маленьком городе был олимпийский чемпион. Мне тогда было пять лет на тот момент. Ну и вот его слова, в принципе, э, так оказалось, что они воплотились в жизнь. Um, it's, it's a funny story. It was, uh, it was like a 92, 93, uh, 1992, 1993, just uh, like uh, started reporters came to one room and there was a lot of people. And uh, uh, the question was, what would you like to be, what would you like to establish in your life? And you know, all the people went through it and the, the, the time came to my father. Vasily says, you know, to his father, and they ask him, what, you know, what would you like, you know, to be? And he says, uh, what I want to be, I want in our little town, which is, we live in a very small town in Ukraine, I want in our little town to somebody to become an uh, Olympic champion. And at that time, Vasily was like maybe four or five years old, and looks like his wish came through. <laughs> Two times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two times. With, with all the great things, I'm going to jump a little bit, then I'll let Kenny take over again. But with all the great things you've done, professionally, average, everything, what means the most? The Olympic gold medals or the World Olympic, yeah. Olympic gold medal. Uh, first Olympic Games, because it was my child dream. It was my child goal. I live with this goal and... I go to bed, I wake up, I eat, I go to school and I go to the gym one with thing. this, yeah, one thing, to be Olympic champion. And that brings me to my next question, which is a, uh, that's a perfect setup because I'm dying to hear what motivated you to go back to the London Games in 2012 after already winning gold so you could probably go and make arguably millions of dollars within the next one or two years by turning professional in 2008 with a gold medal. You have all the accoutrements to like go be a superstar. What was it that made you go back in 2012 in return to the Olympics? What made me motivated on the second Olympics? On the second Olympics, so you could go to the first Olympics. You know, I have, maybe I have a special, a special uh, character, that yes. character, mm, character, special character. I want to be in the history, and after first Olympic Games, I want, I wanted, da? Yeah, I, I, want. I wanted, uh, went to pro, but father explained me, hey, you, you don't rush. We need, we need to win one more Olympic Games, and after that we can go, we can go to pro. And you know, we sit down, spoke a lot of time, uh, and after after our discuss, um, I решение. No, I, I decided. I decided we need go to. Uh, second Olympic Games because in in Ukraine we don't have twice box uh, boxer who won two times Olympic Games. In Ukraine we don't have a guy who won the Olympics twice. Yeah, for right. me it's a it's, for me I, it's a page I, I, in the history. I have news for you. Not too many countries have anyone <laughs> who wins two Olympic gold medals. Not just the Ukraine. Anywhere. It's has very, there, it's very rare. But, I don't know but, that there's ever been. Has there ever been another uh, male to win two? Because I, I think Clarissa yes. Shields won two. No, no, two. no. There's three people in the history of the Olympics that won three. Yeah. Oh wow. Three, three people. Yeah, just three. To, yeah. yeah, three. Tefelio Stevenson, the heavyweight from Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, Felix Savan, the heavyweight from Cuba, and and Laszlo Pop, the great middleweight from Hungary. From Hungary. Yes. Yeah. I would assume that the, the, the I, I figured two of the three would be uh, Cuban with the uh, amateur program they have there. And now uh, we're going to get into one of the um, Cuban fighters who um, you recently defeated. But um, when you when you initially went pro, you signed with Bob Arum as soon as the uh, after the 2012 Olympics. You've been no, with him no, 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 no. I I went to 
uh, half half professional. It's, okay. it's World Series World Series Boxing. WSB. Yeah, yeah WSB. Uh, I fought a couple years or maybe one year. No, one year. One year. I fought one year and 2013 I signed contract with a top rank. Okay. And I know that from um, speaking with Alex and Teddy that the big part of your um, training program involves um, uh, psychology and uh, the mental aspect of fighting. Can you talk to me a little bit about the mental preparation that you go through and how you work with your sports psychologist? Because I believe he's a part of your camp full time. He's with you constantly in camp, just like a physical trainer. You have a psychological trainer who works with you throughout the camp. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Uh, I have I have a three times a day train uh, first months in my camp mm -hmm. first first months and after after every training I have a special special exercises I have a special uh, train for my mind for my head uh, and for my uh, Nervous system. A nervous system. Yeah, Nerv yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a special exercise. Uh, I can explain you. We have a special we have a special uh, equipment, mm -hmm. and I work with this equipment. M maybe for you it's more interesting and more understand for you will be if you, if uh, you explain my psychology you know yeah. <laughs> it's more more comfortable for you and more comfortable for me yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> because for me it's hard to explain you in english yeah no i've seen some if, if he turns around there's wires that come around. <laughs> there, there are wires that come out of him. And he has very special people to make sure those wires are always just right. Well, it's hard to argue with anything you've done considering the way you've run through people. It's been wildly impressive, which is why we were both so excited to speak with you just about some of the other aspects other than the physical attributes. Ken, you have to re realize, excuse me, he's, these things are nothing new to him. He's been trained this way since he's six years old. When was your first uh, time in the gym? Six? First, know, first maybe, fight. maybe on the third day. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a record. He came out I'm fighting. gonna argue that that's a record. <laughs> <laughs> because because you know then yeah. then yeah Please. after 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 um, burn house yeah. yeah after then you know, then then his mother mother gave a birth mm -hmm. and the father brought him back home. And my father my father put uh, boxing gloves on my hands. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. They, they even had the picture. They even had the picture. Then he is on a. They, they put him on a on a car hood, and the, <laughs> and then he's about like this big, and the glove is about this big, and and the father put him a glove. Then he was like a three days old. Yeah. Hey, I mean, it's like we're saying in all seriousness, it was a plan. You could call it an experiment, whatever you want to call it, but it was a plan for him to be world champion right from the beginning. His father knew exactly what he was trying to do. And these drills that he does, he does a lot of drills. He'll talk about it. Physical drills, technical drills, but mental drills to get himself ready. The one that I got to jump, I have to say, is, look, if you're going to make somebody, if you're going to make somebody a great chef, you got to get them used to the flames and uh, so they don't get scared when the flame goes up in the kitchen. And if there's hot grease, that they don't get scared if they get burnt with some hot grease. If you're going to make a world champion fighter, forget about the body parts. Forget about the physical parts of it. You have, and the technical parts. But you have to make him mentally where he can control his emotions, his fear. Let's get right to it. Better than anybody else. And his father had plans and an understanding of putting him through things very early that would prepare him for things later. Tell the story about the the ocean, the lake. Ah, uh, then I then I swim uh, four and a half hours. Он за это да имеет в виду что когда я переплыл. Don't ever do this to one of your kids. You know, it's you know, all I think 
A lot of people can do this. A lot of people can do swim lo long time. Yep. But in, in the open have, waters. Yeah, open, yeah. In the open waters. But but mm, not a lot of people can do. Then your your power, your energy, done. Then you feel this feeling. Да, это чувство. Mm -hmm. Then you feel this feeling. You need. You need to find a way. Ты должен заставить себя, ты должен перешагнуть через это. Ты должен, ты видишь берег, и ты должен туда доплыть. Не имеет значения. You have to, you have to go over yourself. You have to, you have, you have, you know, you see, you see already the shore, and you know you have to make it, and you already done, completely done. But you have to overstep over yourself and, and, and make it happen. Вариантов so, больше вариантов нету. Есть вариант один. У тебя вот берег. Тебе нужно сюда по другому. Ты никак. You don't have no choices. You don't have no choices. You have only one choice. This is that's what you have to make it. Or you drown. Or you drown. And, and the lesson or there is. Do you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Or you drown. <laughs> So how many people? I can just see my wife uh, telling me, no, 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 don't put the kids in the ocean, please, don't do it. No, but it's not the ocean, it's no, a lake, it's mean. a lake, yeah. It's, lake or ocean, it, you're it still going to drown, you don't make but it. But he's preparing him for to overcome things that the average person is never prepared, to go to a place that the average person is never prepared to go to. That's what I was going to get to. How about, that's how, about like going, a, how about going underwater and staying there for four and a half minutes? <laughs> How about that? How about that? Four and a half minutes. And, and you know what he says? And he says, if I'm going to pass away and I'll have my, my, my heart and my brain still works for five minutes, my father is going to take me out. <laughs> yeah. I can hear it, my it, wife. It's very, it very helped me. It very helped Alex Gwozdyk, Alex Usyk. Yes. It, it, it's mentally trained. Those kind of exercises, I think what they teach you is that you can overcome a lot more than you think you can when you're forced to deal with the situation at the moment. You know, it's one thing to think, oh, I think I could do that. But when you're actually in there, it basically is giving you an example of, let me show you what you can overcome. Go, do this, and gives you an opportunity to be mentally deal with these kind of challenges. It pushes you to a place that you wouldn't go by yourself. Yes. And that's why that's that's the main reason why he's so special. That's why he was able to fight a fight with Linares with a dislocated shoulder and not panic at all. And listen, other fighters have done it too in this great sport. Other fighters have done those type things. But we're talking about right now why he was able to do that. And with a dislocated shoulder and on your right shoulder, yep. which is his most important hand because he's a southpaw. Mm -hmm. That's his lead hand. 90% mm -hmm. of his punches are coming from there. And now what? Like his father said, when he went to the corner, you say what his father said. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, don't, uh, don't ner nervous because you have uh, another hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And are you are you right-handed? And and did you fight uh, southpaw to use yeah, the right? Yeah, father, father uh, changed my my position to use the dominant hand as the jab and hook, and use the uh, southpaw to to so so you were constantly using the your natural right hand for jabbing and uh, the more active hand, right? Yep. Okay, that was uh that that was a strategy from early days with your dad. I don't know. Maybe maybe he he loves and he respects uh, softball. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My fear in it, Teddy, in in some parents hearing this is thinking, oh. His dad did this. Maybe I'm gonna do this with my kid. And this is takes a very special combination of special people to be able to do these kind of things. And I wanna, I don't wanna dismiss how special they are to be able to do have this kind of relationship and do these kind of things. Because a lot of people want their kids to be superstars, but wanting and doing are two completely different things. You know, I think he changed my position because he want he want uh, teach my head. And my half head work uh, the same, Adinako, da? Adinako. Same, yeah. like the same, same with the right or with the left. 
Yeah. So he just wanted to change, you know, whatever he's saying, like, you know, whatever, he just wanted to change me. Что Where развивалось оба полушария be, на луне. He knew you could throw the right, but he wanted to basically make you be fight as like an ambidextrous, so you could change whenever you want. You can switch positions. But I can't, I can't uh, fight fight with uh, left hand. Да, как это будет? Well, it's orthodox. orthodox. Uh, no, okay. he can he can be he can be an orthodox. I can't, I can't be. Yeah, I yeah. can't be. Because I all my life I I train on a, in a soft bar. Yeah. Uh, but he start he start change my position for I think for для того чтобы развивалось два полушария в голове для этого меня он поменял это. The way he's saying it's kind of like in 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 the brain. Yeah. Everything goes in the brain. That's why that's why his father changed him. To make sure his brain will work equally, both sides, both sides, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know some of Al had showed me um, uh, one of your assistants had showed me um, Vasily's uh, training area up in a special section of the gym, and some of the uh, hand-eye um, exercises that you do on the wall with the different colored numbers and responding to the. Um, to the psychologist's commands and working on hand-eye. And I think that that's an interesting technique that probably not a lot of trainers are using and uh, not a lot of fighters are using, and that would be uh, an interesting revelation or something to speak to that I think people will find interesting is the non-traditional stuff that you're doing to the extent that you're comfortable sharing that is maybe speak to some of those exercises like what exactly are you doing and what is the what are you hoping to get from it what's the um what's the outcome you're looking for я ищу цифры там 25 цифр на каждой таблице я ищу они разбросаны в в хаотичном порядке ну в разном не по порядку я должен найти от 1 до 25 это концентрирует твое внимание ты концентрируешь и удерживаешь концентрацию долгое время это то что необходимо в принципе в бою I'm not going to translate that because it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's, it's kind of like um, uh, numbers, and yep. they go in a different uh, different ways. Orders. So all he needs to do just to concentrate and go like from one number to go to only 25, and it's kind of like a timing where he needs to go like one, two, three, four, five, six, and all the way go oh, to 25. And sometimes his psychologist says, now let's go backwards, mm -hmm. 25, 24, 23, 22. So it goes back and forth, and uh, that's what you need to concentrate, and especially after the hard training to do that, it's not easy, as and it sounds. The other thing that I wanted to speak to you about... Especially is, since the numbers are not as easy as you made them. They don't go in order. He <laughs> switches the order. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then you go to the different... That's why you see not just the one, but you see a different... Uh, different thing. Самое интересное, я делаю эти цифры на протяжении там, семи, восьми, восьми... На протяжении восьми лет. Их позиция, их вот как они находятся, они не меняются. Но я их, ты все равно не можешь их запомнить. Ты, ты не, не, запом, не запомнишь их. And it's the most interesting thing I'm already doing like maybe eight years. And they are exactly the same. But it's impossible to remember it. Every time I come to do it, it's the same thing like I'm doing the first time. Это при том, что у меня хорошая зрительная память. Я все равно их не могу запомнить. And it's, you know, I, I, you know, and I can mention my eye memory is very, very good. I cannot even to remember And just for the fans, it's basically a grid with random numbers on it, just randomly arranged in a square, and it's basically hand pointing to the numbers. It's, I've, I've looked at it. It's pretty complex. Go ahead. Did you ever think when you finish with this career, maybe be a card counter in Las Vegas? You go play cards? <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk about that later. We're talking about that later. Okay? okay. You mean okay. your father. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, Don't mention that because my mind not going to let him go to the casinos and no more. <laughs> no, they let us go until we start winning. When we start winning, then... <laughs> it reminds me of the scene from the movie um, The Hangover, which we were talking about earlier, you know, in The Hangover where he comes down and he's counting cards and he says, it's illegal. And he's like, no, it's not illegal. It's just highly frowned upon. <laughs> Well, 
You guys one, one more question about the psychologist is how much time do you spend one on one with the psychologist just speaking about does he work with you like a traditional psychologist? No, okay. no, it's it's different. It's not it's psychology. It's a it's a sport psychology. He train your mental head. Training. You train your mental training. Yeah, but it's, it's not, not. It's not, not talking. About I don't have mindset. a problem with my uh, <laughs> with, with how you're living your life. <laughs> psychology. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, okay. I just it's, wanted it's to clarify. Different. That. It's different. Psychologist is working between wife and the husband if they not <laughs> getting along together. Or we'll if a person sure not gonna get the divorce. Yeah. Or if a person's yeah. having a hard time <clears throat> dealing with aspects of their life. So to clarify, you know, it, it's not necessarily to do with mindset, more of just like training your brain and hand-eye coordination and be keeping your brain sharp. Yeah. And talk to me about. In the early days, as we discussed, your dad introduced you to boxing very early. And to a certain extent, you can tell anyone, oh, hey, I'm going to introduce you to boxing and we're going to hit the pads and hit the mitts and you look, oh, you look great until someone gets punched in the face. And that's when you can tell, is this guy really want to be a fighter? Because it's inevitable that I know that you want to get hit as little as possible and you're very good at it. But when you get hit in the face, that's when you can tell if somebody really wants to be in the gym. Because if they don't, they're not coming back the next day. Talk to me about the early days of getting hit. And who knows, maybe you haven't been hit. I mean, the, after reading some of these statistics, it doesn't even seem real. But talk to me about the early days of getting hit. I'm assuming to get better, you were sparring better fighters, taking shots. Talk to me about the fear yeah, and if there ever was fear. В общем, мои, мои первые спарринги были с моей двоюродной сестрой, которая была на год меня старше, она была на тот момент чуть немножко крупнее меня. И отец одевал нам перчатки, но мне он одевал перчатки и завязывал сзади шнурки. То есть я не мог выпрямить руку. Если я бью правую, у меня тянет левую. Ты понял, да? Mm -hmm. А я, он развязанный. Я был маленький, мне было 3-4 года. И... А... Она постоянно меня била, то есть а он-то видел, что она меня била, она мне попадала по лицу, мне было больно, но я не прятался, я не закрывал глаза, я там не плакал. Ну, то есть он после этого он понимал и осознавал, что в принципе у меня с характером и с, с волей к победе у меня все в порядке. Но настал тот момент, когда я вырос и понял, что почему меня постоянно бьют и почему я не могу закрыться и защититься, потому что у меня сзади связанные перчатки. When I was a little, uh, three, three, four years old, my father put me in my first sparrings. My father put me with my cousin, who, who was, uh, she was actually the, the female cousin, and she was uh, one year older than me. But what he did, he tied up my hands through the back. So basically, if I if I hit with the right, my my, my left goes here, yeah. or or opposite. So I couldn't I couldn't you know do with both hands. Yeah. So basically, my hands was tied up, and she was uh, hitting me in the face. She was you know she was she was uh, she was hitting me, and my father. But at that moment, I didn't close my eyes. Uh, I was coming back to her. So my father realized uh, everything is perfect with my character mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not afraid i'm not afraid you know to be you know to be hit or i i didn't i didn't uh, i'm not giving up yeah I, i'm not giving up yeah, exactly and then and then he says and i grow up a little bit i found out why i cannot hit her because my my hands were tied up да и просто в тот момент был я помню эту историю я просто перекинул назад мне надоело, что меня бьют. Я просто перекинул из-за шеи назад эти веревки. Начал их дал пару раз, и она заплакала. На этом мы закончили спарринги. And then, then I find out, so I just throw the rope in front of me, and I hit her a couple times, and she starts crying, and that, that was the last sparring we ever did with her. И после этого уже мне было 4, там, да, уже 4-5, и тогда я уже спарринговал с and then after that, and after that, then I was already like a five, six years old. Already, my father already put me with my same age guys. Not to, same age. No. no. Никогда не боксировал. Я всегда боксировал. Они были старше меня. Они всегда были тяжелее меня. Uh, okay, so not same age, not same weight. It's always, always my sparring partner was uh, older me and, and bigger. bigger me and uh, with a bigger weight and. Uh, because that's the part that you can't plan for. Because if, 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 uh, as the young boy, if you don't want or 
can't get past that fear or, or that feeling of being punched in the face, all the training in the world isn't going to help if the head's not right. If you don't, if you don't crave that kind of competition and, and I don't want to say enjoy, but if you are not comfortable with getting punched, it's not going to go very well. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you're afraid, of course, if you're afraid, then you're afraid of you, nothing will happen. Of course, if you, you know, if you're afraid of, 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 of be punched or, you know, if you're afraid of anything to be there, so, of course, it's, uh, in, none of the trainers can, can make you a, go, a great fighter. That's right. So you have to have all those pieces before you start to get into like the real technical part of it. But talk to me about at what point did your dad have you stop boxing and do Ukrainian dance? I never stop training oh, boxing. Okay. I never stop. I I use and uh, after school I use a dance. Yep. And after dance I go to boxing training. And and how old were you when you started uh, the Ukrainian dance? I think it was 10, 10 or 12 years. Okay. And I, I used dance, dancing a couple years. I don't like it. Uh, you don't like it? No, I don't like it. But I, I use because my, my father chantageur on me. He was playing with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you, if you, if you not use a dancing, you can't train a boxing. <laughs> That's an interesting technique. I'm gonna to have to make a note of that for my own children. He, he understand and he see. I love I love boxing and I want training. He he down video that no. he see. No, he saw. He saw. He saw my my uh, desire. My desire. That's why. That's why he can built me and the rationale was if he could get you to dance for a couple of years it would help with your footwork i don't know i can live i can live second life and yeah. uh, repeat my life without dancing you know? <laughs> yeah. but we do know that you have the best legs in boxing right now <laughs> <laughs> thank you well when we're done we're gonna see a sample of your ukrainian dance you don't know this we have a ukrainian band ready to play the ukrainian music and let you dance in the ring no, I... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you don't know. That's not happening. <laughs> Rob, cancel the Ukrainian band. <laughs> Talk to me about the adjustment from amateurs to pros, because a lot of times, and Teddy, I think you and I have spoken about this before. They're almost, they can almost be like two different sports, very different skill sets. Some guys are very good amateurs, not so good pros. Obviously, some people make a good transition, but talk to me about the differences and the kind of adjustments that you've had to make. You know, for me, different different rules. Mm -hmm. Not 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 style. Not boxing. Not it, 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 the same. Boxing. It it's just one boxing. Amateur, professional, mm -hmm. but rules. Yeah, rules is different. Rules make. Uh, Rules teach you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same. Then you, then you, born, born, you go to садик как будет. Kindergarten. Kin yeah. Kindergarten. After that, you go to school, and mm -hmm. after school, you go to university. It's the same. Amateur boxing, it's like school, but pro, it's university. Of course, after after school, you need prepare for university. Mm -hmm. So, for me. It was very fast, and uh, for me it was a very. I had a very big, big experience. Uh, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if if you ask me, if you have one more chance, and you can change your. Do uh, it all again. Yeah, I answer no, no. Everything do the you same. Know, yeah. Yeah, because because it it was a very big and very very fast uh opet zabil, yeah. Opet. experience. Experience. Very very fast experience yeah. for me. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't wanna I don't wanna go in a pro mm -hmm. and fight fought with uh, guys who just start tr training boxing. You like a, you didn't want tune-up fights. You wanted the best in the world from the first fight, right? Yeah. And I know, I guess you had mentioned that uh, you had wanted to 
go to the pros and fight for a title first fight out the gate, right? Mm-hmm. And ended up taking you the third fight to get a world title. Well, which but is, we still, you know, we still, he still uh, fought for the, it wasn't a major title, it was a minor title. On the first on fight? On the first fight, yeah. Oh, I hadn't realized that. <laughs> I he, guess I, he, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. He but. started he started with a ten rounds and uh, and he got uh, if it was a WBO international inter intercontinental international no, international international, international. Yeah, WBO inter, yeah, international yeah, and he was uh, scheduled for the uh, ten rounds and finished in a six I believe right. I don't body remember. Punch. Body punch. But body I punch. Don't it was a body punch. And Teddy, I don't think most people will realize and appreciate how significant that is because most pros coming up will start with four round fights, maybe three, four, five, four rounders, then six, eight, yeah, ten. It's I, unheard of. I listen. I think I appreciate it because I know somebody that after his first pro fight put him on a pound for pound. Best fighters in the world list. <laughs> and uh, who did it? And I know who did it. <laughs> after one fight, <laughs> had him on a list for pound for pound top 10. And um, a few people were yelling at me, saying, what are you doing? I say, I think I know what I'm doing. I think I understand why. And uh, that's what I did. I put Lomachenko uh, in the top 10 after his first fight. Mm -hmm. Because I knew... I thought I knew what he was. I, I called his fights for NBC in the Olympics, so I saw him. But I, I saw something else. I saw the package. Yeah. And I saw what he, what he was already and what he, was gonna be, what he could become. And I, remember, and I remember also that. I remember very well. I saw, I saw Vasily in Chicago, 2007. Uh, I was in Chicago at the mm -hmm. 2000. I saw him, and people were talking about how special he is. But I, you know, years goes through, and I heard about his first Olympic, and you know, then then I saw a couple fights him as a in the amateurs. Then I heard about the second Olympics. He won the Olympic medal, and then I saw one of the interviews Teddy did, and I. He was after Olympics and uh, interview was, uh, well, I just came back from London. I was calling the fights. I don't know. Maybe you don't even remember that, Teddy, but I, I remember for sure. And then he said, uh, all of those fighters from all the amateur, what I saw when I was in London, uh, I didn't see anything special. He didn't see no American fighters. And he said, uh, the only one guy I can recall could be something in this professional game as a boxing. He says that was a Vasily Lomachenko. And I really remember that. And then I saw his fights at the WSB when he was fighting. And I kind of like make to myself, I said, I got to get this guy. I have to get this guy. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> I can't stress I can't stress to people enough how how um, impressive an amateur record of 396 wins and one losses because as Teddy and I have you as you and I have discussed the amount of corruption around some boxing organizations especially in 2012 there were some big articles I think written by the WB um, uh, by the BBC about in particular Azerbaijan and potential illegal payments, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that this had been written, has been written about Wiley. It, it just highlights how impressive it is to win 396 fights and only have one setback in 07 at the Worlds and then to avenge that loss twice. It's just, it, it's crazy. I mean, the amount of, the amount of potential for a bad decision is just, it's astronomical. So to come through that and just keep winning and keep winning is, uh, it's wildly impressive. No, you you just I believe you just uh, mentioned the, the the most touchable subject for Teddy because Teddy talks about that all the time about the judging and about and and about how corrupted it is and uh, unfortunately we are in a in a sport like that and that, that's what no that's what it is and uh, of course you know we've saw many many let me even bring back his second professional fight the Fesolido. Mm -hmm. How many? 40, 41 or 42 low blows. 
not even not even warn from a referee. So, and just to bring the listeners up to speed, this is his second pro fight ever. He's in against Orlando Salido, who was a cagey, wily, very experienced professional fighter and uh, lost a very controversial split decision there. And um, I want to also point out that the guy missed weight by almost three pounds, um, so probably came into the ring a good 10 to maybe even 20 pounds heavier than you on fight night. Nevertheless, that was for a vacant title. Third fight, you come in for the fight. The, the, because Salido missed weight so egregiously, the title was still vacant. Then you came back on the third fight and won that fight. Um, but that was that's an interesting topic that you bring up. And, and the fact that that was one of the only blemishes on your record. I'm just curious, what was your mindset with that at po- after that fight to Salido? What, did you feel it was a bad decision? And how did you come to grips with it? Or did you just dismiss it and move on and on to the next one? Конечно, я не был, я не был э, согласен с тем, с решением судьи. Я не был согласен. Э, я долго, оно мне, это поражение долго не уходило у меня с головы. Но когда я готовился к третьему поединку за титул чемпиона мира, я тогда уже не думал ни о солида, ни о том, что я там проиграл. Я У меня в голове была только одна цель – стать чемпионом мира. Um, of course, I never agreed with the decision what I lost that fight in my head. And um, it was for a long time, for a long time, it was in my head that loss. I, you know, I was carrying with me all the time. But as soon as um, it was announced, my third bout for the world champion i knew i'm going to be fighting for world champion i put that on the site it completely went out of my mind the loss against salido and i was preparing for the third bout and it only was one thing into my mind i have to become a world champion very good well mission accomplished Can you talk to me a little bit about what a typical training camp looks like? So when the one from the time the fight is announced, how many weeks out do you typically start preparation? Сколько недель? You know, my my schedule, my schedule uh, it's uh, I start train at home one month in Ukraine. In Ukraine, yep. yeah, one month one and a half before the fight two months before the fight i i start my training camp and i come come back in united states mm-hmm. i come back in camarillo and i start my training camp two months before the fight okay but but bef- even between the fight i, I still training yeah, and after after the fight, after the fight, I come back in Ukraine. I rest one month. I I never come in the gym, and uh, one month just rest. No exercise, no, no road exercise, road, nothing. No, no, no. After after one month, I I start I start uh, a little bit, a little bit train, mm-hmm. and and. And build and build my body. Yeah. yeah. Basically, we know exactly like no, not exactly like we don't know the exactly date, but we know when his next fight it will be. Like for example, we uh, he fought in December, right? December eighth, the fight was. Then he went back home. We already knew approximately it's going to be April. So for one month he didn't do anything, and then he started beginning of February. Now he started doing some exercises. And now when you come to the U.S., like just a typical training day, as you said, you mentioned that you're training three times a day. Yeah. And that includes, I'm assuming, road work, strength training, and sparring. Is you, how, explain to me what a typical day in I Canada start, I looks start like. at 5 a.m. Yep. It, it's uh, one hour uh, cardio training. Mm-hmm. Second train is 12 a.m. at the mm, No, p.m. PM. Yeah, 12 p.m. 12 p.m. Uh, I use a swimming pool or 
I have a train in a beach and uh, third train I have a 6 p.m. it's a boxing training mm -hmm. and when you go to the beach you're swimming at, sw swimming in the ocean no 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 I swim in the in the pool oh that must be a nice the... break from being dropped in the ocean <laughs> no it's cold water I don't like <laughs> I don't like it either <laughs> And now, what are your thoughts on, so you're currently campaigning at lightweight. Uh, is, is it your intention to continue to move up in weight class? Would you like to unify all the belts in lightweight? What is your ultimate goal in terms of weight classes? Now, now my goal is to uh, unificate all titles. And I want to be... How can it be? Absolute, 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 no? Undisputed. Undisputed, undisputed world champion. Of lightweight division. Yeah, yeah, yep. So next that's why day. That's why That's why. I jump in the weight classes, you know? Yeah. I start in featherweight and I think I can, I can do this. Mm -hmm. But I can't. I I go uh, go up. 130, I think, oh, we can, we can make it. But we can't uh, make uh, a lot of fights. Uh -huh. We can make uh, uh, fights with the champions. That's why I go uh, next weight category. So, Be yeah, because it's a, you know it's a politics. It's it's a networks. It's, a, it's really it's a, <laughs> in boxing. You're no. kidding me. <laughs> Don't you know that, Eddie? No. Let me let me let me let me take you to school. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why you know he went with different weight classes because it's you know this promoter has this guy. This guy belongs to another network. So 126, 130, we couldn't collect all the belts. But I think at the 135, the next time we're gonna do uh, this podcast with. You guys, Teddy, we will need the two more tables because we need to put the two more belts here. <laughs> <laughs> no but problem. if if in the, if in the future uh, my promoter can make me a fight in a top fight with a top fighter in a 130, I can go down. Mm -hmm. I can lose my weight and fight with a top fighter in a 130. Problem. How heavy do you think you can fight? Do you think you can fight at welterweight? No, I think it's no. now it's my it's my level. limit level, level. level. yeah because okay. because because uh, 135 it's not my natural uh, yeah. weight. He doesn't have even to make a 135 weight. He, he can easily. He's yeah. had three division titles, you know, 26, 30, 35. Yeah. yeah. That's enough. <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, he seems to be able and, and to do whatever he wants and he, and to do. He wouldn't do. go to welterweight. He would go to 140, junior yeah. welterweight. Yeah, yeah. But his body, his size. There's, I, I'm there's 31 years old. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not 20 yeah. years old, you know. Yeah. It's interesting you say take that. It, take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you told me he was going to fight at, at, at middleweight, I would be like, well, I guess his dad, if his dad says he can do it, he's done everything else. I don't know where's the limit for this guy. He doesn't seem to be able to be beaten anywhere at anything. Um, and it's interesting that you um, uh, bring up the age because you and I had spoken about this earlier about um, Javante Davis recently won a fight and and um, he's an exciting young fighter and some of the, the press was asking him after the fight, what do you think of Lomachenko and immediately Floyd who doesn't like to share the spotlight additionally likes to speak for Javante Davis, he says um, why should we fight Lomachenko, he's only getting older we can make the same money fighting other people and it was just interesting to get that insight, and it was surprisingly candid for uh, Floyd, the manager, to l like open this insight into his thinking of like, yeah, they're, they're trying to avoid the, the, the fight that people really want to see. That's a dangerous fight. I mean, I don't, what are your thoughts on um, some of the fighters that are out there? Is there anyone in particular that, that you want to, that you'd like to fight? Look, they, they are businessmen. Mm -hmm. They are now athletes. Mm -hmm. They are businessmen. They are making money. I am athletes and I want to fight with the top fighters. I want to fight with the uh, top guys for history, mm -hmm. for my history, for boxing history. That, that's why we can make uh, fights. Hey, guess how hard is it to get people to um, accept this fight against Vasily? Um, it was, in the beginning, it was very hard because um, 
So, you know, basically nobody wants to fight a guy five and you know, or five and one, you know, three and one. And, you know, but now because he has already established pound for pound number one, uh, everybody knows what, you know, fighting Lomachenko, we can make money. And I think right now it's a little bit easier than it used to be because, you know, right now we wanted to fight Loma, you know, uh, uh, right now it's easier because, you know, he got, you know, one of the fights with Mariaga, he got cut, you know, uh -huh. he was bleeding. So they saw he's not a machine, he's a human being. You know, he has the blood also. Uh, did, they, did they check? Because there's a there's a room out there that it, it was diesel, it was, uh, that it was that oil. Oil. Yeah. Oil. Oil. Yeah, oil, oil was it was engine but, but this was red. You know, Linares had him with a, with a punch where he you know he was S dropped. STP oil treatment is red. <laughs> okay, red. Right, yeah. Linares had him with a punch. You know, he was dropped. So now everybody thinks, oh, you know, he's all oh, Lomachenko is beatable now. And if we, I'm going to beat, you know, the fighter thinks, if I'm going to beat, I'm going to put my name all the way to top. So I think right now it's uh, easier to get, uh, to get, uh, to get the uh, opponents for him than it used to be. That's an interesting observation because I think a lot of people like to point to that knockdown like as if it was almost the equivalent of a win. It's like, oh, they got him, they knocked him down, but I mean, he still come back and stopped him with body shots, I believe, right? With, yeah. with, with one arm. And that's yeah. the yeah, thing. Yeah, that, yeah, a lot of people arm. forget, that's forget the thing about that, this. I don't yeah. think people forget. I don't think anyone's ever spoken about it. I, I, I had never heard that you had a dislocated shoulder in the fight. You had surgery <laughs> after that fight. Matter of fact, that brings me to the next question for me. How's your shoulder? How is it? Good? Yeah, 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 good. Uh, you look good in your last fight, y you know, with Pedraza. You, you look good. And um, no problems? Everything everything okay? No, no problem. But, you know, in, in that fight, I didn't use my right hook because because I give for my shoulder a little bit longer time. You worried for, about it a little <laughs> bit in that fight, about using it? I, I don't worry, but I... I maybe subconscious during no no during during my preparation I never use I never train my right hook for the Petraza. yeah yeah for for uh for longer uh for, 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 for recovery to, to, to for recovery yeah for longer healing. recovery yeah yeah, yeah. So, now now I start to use right hook now I start train my right uh, hand right hook so if you if you if you look at the fight with a Petraza, he never used the right hook with yeah, a Petraza in a fight because so that's pretty amazing. You went into a fight with a top guy, and you took one of your one of your weapons away. You you had to go. You took away one of your weapons in a fight with a you know with a he, he top class too fighter. He has too many, so he can put one away. That's that's how we make <laughs> you normal. We take one of your weapons <laughs> away. We say you can't use this. You um. That is impressive. I mean, most people would not, if they didn't hear it right now, they would never understand that, that you would go into a fight with the discipline, the confidence, and the ability to take away one of your punches and still be able to be effective in a fight. Um, congratulations. Thank you. That's, Thank that's, you. that's pretty special. Uh, but and, and Pedraza was... He fought a good fight, Pedraza. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people, yeah. I got mad at people because they were saying, oh, he's, what are you talking about? Do you understand? This guy's a good fighter. Forget about the Javante Davis fight. Sometimes a loss makes you a better fighter. Sometimes after you lose a fight, you mature. You understand what you have to do. You understand your identity, how you need to fight. Against Javante Davis, Pedraza didn't understand that. He was just fighting. But after that fight, he grew up. He understood how to use range. And he used range very well. You you came in three inches, he went back five. <laughs> and and много, yeah, много нюансов было в бою с Петрасом, у меня с Петрасом. Первое, если сравнивать с Дэвисом, с Дэвисом он боксировал, он согнал очень много веса. Uh, it was a many different thing was when he fought Javon uh, Davis, he had to lose a lot of weight. Здесь он боксировал в своем весе, а я не в своем. 
he was fighting here at, at his weight class. Mm -hmm. I wasn't at that weight class. И когда он боксировал с Педрасой, он шел с ним дрался, он шел вперед. А когда он боксировал со мной, он от меня бегал. Then he was fighting Pedraza. Uh, then Pedraza was fighting Davis. He went and he fought. He was coming forward yes. with, with Davis. With me, he wasn't coming. He was that's running a, back. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's exactly right. И, и самое и самое третье, что интересно, э, в нокдауне, когда он очутился в нокдауне, он встал и он был готов продолжать, но рефери остановил этот поединок. Когда с этим с Дэвисом, да. когда он боксировал. And then, and then, then he was dropped. He stood up and he was ready to fight, but the referee stopped the fight. So he was ready. You know, I listen. That's why I said what I said. Pedraza was a whole different fighter uh, the night with you. Uh, much smarter, uh, much more complete, and much more understanding of how he needed to fight. Yeah, yeah. His identity was was there against. Davis, for all the reasons you just pointed out, but there was no identity that way. He was just go get him. And that was the wrong way to fight against a guy who can punch and who's a bigger guy. The one interesting thing, uh, before we wrap things up, just a couple more questions, but I'm interested in your thoughts on a lot of the trash talking that goes on in a promotion. You know, um, Davis, just to use Davis as an example, is with Floyd. Floyd made a ca career out of talking a lot, but you seem to have always be radiating supreme confidence and not even engaging in the back and, back and forth, like it's completely unfazed by this stuff. And you could see sometimes people, they almost beat before they get into the ring by the other guys posturing and um, shenanigans outside of the ring. How do you cope with this? And what are your thoughts about trash talking as it relates to promoting the fight? You're asking a guy how he copes with freaking words when a guy was in the ocean, with, 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 to, left in the ocean, either you swim or you drown. And you ask him, how do you deal with words? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I like he, the, he never, Are you never, kidding me? He never goes in the trash talking. Oh I like God. hearing his no. insight and sharing his thoughts on just all of the aspects um, of fighting. Go ahead. <laughs> Как ты относишься к вот этому? Если так? как я отношусь, мне нравится. Я, как, как э, допустим, болельщику, мне нравится, когда происходит трэштокин. Мне нравится вот это шоу, которое устраивает там Макгрегором и с Майвезером. Вот, вот наподобие этого всего оно интересно наблюдать. Лично я, я не могу этого себе позволить. If you ask me a question about the trash talking, then and I am a fan looking from the side, I like I like the way McGregor goes with Floyd and often they talk. I like to see it. Mm. Then it comes to me personally. I'm not allowed to, 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 to do that stuff. I'm not talking. <laughs> well, you mentioned McGregor. Since you've pre pretty much beaten everyone else in boxing, uh, should we look for you in the MMA anytime soon? No. Maybe we no, see you fight in a no, cage. <laughs> no, no, no. Every, no every fighter need to be in... Uh, and his his best uh, I know, position best, yeah, best position if you wrestler and if you fighter in the UFC you you need to fight and UFC rules if yeah. you're a boxer you need boxing in a boxing rules yeah um and then so before we wrap things up the next fight I guess is uh, April 12th correct at uh, Staples, Staples Center, Center yeah. here in LA um, where can people find you and keep track of you on, uh, are you on social media? Do you have Twitter, Instagram? Where can people find you so the fans can follow along and maybe what you've been, what you're up to outside of the ring? It's name and second name, Vasily Lomachenko. You can put in a search, uh, search, search and you just <laughs> Vasily Lomachenko. You, but you're on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. And uh, when you're in camp here, does your family come with you? Yeah. Wife, children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your dad, obviously. And, the, and your um, psychologist or mental preparation coach, he also is with you full-time in camp? Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, listen. Really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us. It's... Um, 
incredibly kind to have of you to share some time with us and uh i just went to i'm looking for a deck of cards so we can start practicing <laughs> our, our card counting tricks uh, or skills <laughs> Well, yeah, like I say, look, I know you're in camp and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your uh, thoughts and share your story with us. I know that the fans, uh, a lot of fans are very interested. There's been a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people that were very excited to hear more about you as the person, not uh, just the fighter. Thank you. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, Teddy, if you don't have any, you have anything else? I just wanted to tell them thank you for making the sport better. You make this sport better by being the person you are, too. And uh, caring about the things you care about, family and people and, you know, not just you, other good fighters out there, too, that make this sport better. And you're one of them in, in many ways. And, so are you. Uh, so are you, Teddy. Uh, you're I, making this sport better. I, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, I don't know if everybody agrees. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy's new slogan is make boxing great again. But I don't know if everybody <laughs> is, anyway agrees, but I appreciate it. And um, I just want to want to say something to the people that might not completely understand or able to see exactly what you do and how you do it. You know, I joke with you one time, but I was being serious, but I was saying it in fun when I was doing an interview with you for ESPN. I said, what makes you the taker of men's souls? <laughs> you know, for me, you know, you, you're like the predator, where the predator came down with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that first movie. Remember you saw it, the predator with Arnold yeah, Schwarzenegger? Yeah. <laughs> Predator. He, 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 nah. yeah. and, and he collected he collected men's souls. He he would take men well he did a little more than that. He also took their heads. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he made trophies out of them. Yeah. But joking around they said they said in the movie he makes trophies out of men's souls. You you make trophies out of men's souls. And I'm just saying that I mean you went and you made fighters do something, quite a few of them, that you're never supposed to do as a fighter. Never. You can lose. People lose. But you're never supposed to quit. And you made fighters quit. And not one, not two, not three. And you made some really good fighters quit. You know, Walters... I mean, Walters was an undefeated world champion. Uh, Rigondeaux, two-time gold medalist, undefeated world champion. I mean, these are not, you know, just regular guys. And you made them quit. And for me, what makes you able to make a fighter do something that he never should do is that you take their hope away. You don't just overcome them with power and, and, you know, physical strength. You do it with this, you do it with your body, you do it with your technique. And you put pressure on people while you make them miss, which is hard to do. You're pressing and you're making them miss, and at the same time, you're on them. So you make them feel like, where is my hope? If I can't hit him... If I can't put my hands on them the way I need to, then I have no hope. And you see some fights where there's a war and both guys go all the way, but they're able to hit each other, so there's hope. But with you, what you've done in those cases is you took their hope away. And when you take a man's hope away, he becomes empty. And then there's nothing there, there's just a body. And the body falls. And I just want to tell you that I, I don't know of a lot of people because I, people used to ask me when I was doing the ESPN fights, Teddy, what makes Lomachenko? I got into an argument with a guy, I love him, Stephen A. Smith. You know, <laughs> I got into a big argument with him on TV. I love Stephen. But he would be like, Teddy, what, what are you, why does he, how does these guys quit? Why are they quitting? Why are they doing that? I said, Stephen, let me put you in there <laughs> with a guy 
that you can't hit and he's hitting you and he keeps coming and he keeps coming, but you can't do what you want to do and you have no hope. So I just wanted to say that for the people out there. And if you want to touch on it, please, you could say something if you want. Пригласили, спасибо, что... Кстати, узнали новые истории э, обо мне, о том, как, как развивалась моя карьера. Очень приятно было находиться с вами и пообщаться. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, uh, you heard some new stories, which nobody else heard it, so about my... My my prior my when I was growing up, so uh, it was a fantastic time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for being Thank you here. very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.